Welcome to another installment of Carl's Corner. We're here with Carl Frist. And Carl, thank you so much for being here with us. Well, it's a pleasure to be here again. So, Carl, my first question for you is you've spent years studying biological intelligence. When you see artificial intelligence systems fail, what is fundamentally wrong with their approach? I think a failure to comply with those natural laws and principles that underwrite the way that we work, both at an evolutionary scale and day to day in in our daily lives. Um, and those principles can either be read in terms of biology or in terms of physics. So if you go back to your school boy days of physics, you have um, come across things like Newton's laws, all examples of something called a principle of least action. So this basically says that the way that the world works is it finds the path of least effort, the most efficient path, the path of least action, where action is time times energy. So if you now want to replicate things like intelligence or ecosystems or any complex system that has some adaptive intelligent aspect, then you need to apply the principles of least action or maximum efficiency, also known as minimum redundancy. Um, I think that artificial intelligence, machine re re uh, learning research, has lost sight of that. Um, and I think it's understandable because if you take an engineering approach as opposed to a, a, an approach that a physicist would take, it's very easy to wander away from the underlying first principles. When you look at real-world operations, and they require something more than pattern matching or massive data sets, how does active inference get what traditional AI gets wrong? How does it get it right in an unpredictable environment? Well, well I think the answer, as usual with your questions, is in the way that you, <laughs> you ask the question. Um, it's the unpredictability. I mean, I mean, just think about what, you know, what are the problems that people contend with? Say, take the markets, take uh, financial or fintech. Um, it's the, the confidence expressed by the market. It's the unpredictability of Trump, for example. You know, all of these um, things speak to the importance of being able to quantify your confidence or its complement uncertainty. So in order to be efficient, you have to be able to account for the uncertainty, what you don't know, which means that you need to be able to quantify, represent, encode, and store your uncertainty as part of your sense-making. At Versus, we've talked about the idea of active infer inference versus static or passive inference on a large language model that is looking at old uh, patterns in data sets and looking at the, the, the cor correlations versus the cause and effect of, of actively moving into the future. It, and you suggested the term a forward model. Uh, could you explain a bit uh, the difference between the looking backward and, and looking forward in a forward model? Yeah, right. again, that's a really important distinction. So I mean, if we just use large language models to exemplify the fundamental difference between um, generative AI in the sense of machine learning and the kind of generative, generalized artificial intelligence that um, you know, we aspire to, um, then we're talking about the difference between something that has agency, something that has authentic agency that can act upon the world. Now, to be an agent is to be able to select among different acts, different policies, different paths into the future that will secure the kind of content or outcomes or information that provide the most evidence for you as a model of that content. So you need to be able to act in a way that determines the kind of data or content you're going to be able to use to resolve your uncertainty. So this has a fundamentally future-pointing aspect. So agency necessarily implies that your generative model has to include the consequences of your action. Because if you don't have that, you can't evaluate what to do next in the service of gathering the right kind of content or information that you need in order to resolve your uncertainty. So at the moment, things like transformer architectures and most large language models, in fact, all large language models, simply do not have this future pointing aspect. 
They can certainly predict what's going to happen next, but this is not under their control. This is not an expression of agency. To be an agent, the large language model would have to choose who to listen to. And in fact, strictly speaking, to be an agent, a large language model would have to actually issue the prompts. Obviously, you've worked in a lot of capacities with a lot of different organizations and companies. How is working this collaboration with versus different than what you've been doing with other groups? I think it's different because um, it was a convergence, um, you know, and a convergence um, of academia and industry uh, and a convergence of minds, literally. So, you know, I got into um, this game through being exposed to the early visions of verses, uh, you know, um, that were encompassing things like the spatial web and the spatial web foundation. So, you know, um, a very much um, for the common good um, approach that was quintessentially biometric, taking a sort of you know, natural intelligence ecosystem perspective on things, um, which was very conciliant with the application of things like active inference and the free energy principle to um, dialect interactions am amongst uh, amongst agents that we were pursuing and still pursuing indeed in uh, cognitive uh, science and or cognitive neuroscience and uh, so, you know, computational psychiatry, for for example. So um, that was uh, that that was um, that was quite unique. It's you know to, to actually find that the same conclusions and the same visions and the same commitments have arisen independently. Sometimes people refer to this convergent evolution uh, when the when these minds meet. Uh, so that that that's that's a unique, uh, I think, aspect of my involvement with with verses. A more banal answer um, is that all my students grew up and left me, and the majority of them got paid by verses, as the had said, come 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 and uh, come and uh, engage, you know, enjoy yourself in this uh, in this commercial uh, or, or or company sphere, uh, and did so with with great um, well great persuasion on the one hand but also with a unique offering that versus, um, you know, it's not the first time it's happened. I mean, Google DeepMind started I I exactly this way, that there was, you know, a little university, a little academic college in a bigger company. And do you see in, in the work that's even just happened in the last year, do you see a convergence of these technologies coming together to produce, you know, w this biological intelligence you know uh, you know a la agi in some sort that that we're headed towards that path do you see that convergence coming together in the past few i would say weeks of uh, but certainly months um a lot of these strands have come to fruition to provide proof of concepts and demonstrations which you know I won't say knock your socks off because that's a little that's a bit trivial, but um, it, it's it, it's the same kind of oh, did they really do that? It's like when you cook your own meal, you can never really what well, you know what uh, you can never really enjoy the consumption. But I was able to just stand back and just look at the products of all this cooking for the past two years and think, what well, that's a remarkable piece of work. Uh, so yes, I think there have been denouements to these programs um, that are now. Um, that people can now showcase and say and, and and be quite proud of. The next step, of course, is to get somebody to see them and to uh, say, yes, well, if you can do that, imagine what you could do in this domain or with this money or uh, in this you know in this kind of application. And what was most exciting about this last month? There were a number of things, and I, I won't pick one, which uh, just reiterates how impressed I was with uh, the simulations and the um, the performance on these both um, sort of machine learning benchmarks, but also sort of physical intelligence uh, benchmarks. What, what, did, what did intrigue me was um, dialogue um, with um, Francois uh, Cholet, uh, who is the engineer uh, behind what's called an ARC challenge. Uh, it just, again, it was a sort of kind of convergence, a meeting of minds, but in this, in this particular instance, between verses and a subset of the machine learning community and artificial intelligence community 
um, earnestly trying to find the next big step, um, both implicitly convinced that it's going to be along this sort of system two style um, reasoning, more barometric kind of intelligence that is, if you like, what one expression of active inference when properly deployed. Um, and, you know, b both sides of the conversation versus and the, I've uh, been the engineers of the, arc, you know, the arc challenges, just trying to seed each other out to what their respective commitments were. So not exciting from the point of view of company development, but sort of intellectually quite arousing in the sense that, you know, there are people you can play with and impress and, and be impressed by um, that could potentially in the future make a real difference. Carl, you get asked lots of questions all the time. Is there one question that you wish you'd been asked that no one has ever asked? <laughs> it's the third time you've done this. That one. That I, <laughs> I'll have to think about that. Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, to, 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 to be honest, um, I mean, the whole point of being asked questions is to say your, uh, your curiosity and your um, intrinsic motivation. Uh, the, the receiver, I just enjoy being asked questions. Um, I have to say there aren't many questions that I haven't been asked. When you get old, um, you um, after a few years, especially when you get known for being an expert in this or that, it's very rare that I get asked a question I haven't been asked several times before. Uh, apart from the two that you just asked me. <laughs> so I'm a bit stumped by that. Carl, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. It's always a treat, and I look forward to the next time. Yeah, thank you very much.